and letting everybody in. Here they come. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this morning's Tourism Task Force meeting. I'm going to give everybody just a quick second to come in the room. We have a very, very busy agenda for you here this morning. So we will be doing self introductions at the end of the meeting. The meeting may even go a little bit over and then we'll be doing self introductions at the conclusion of the meeting. But just so you guys know, we will do those. Please stick with us at the end and we will do some self introductions. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so if you would please make sure that you stay on mute until we get to the question section of the meeting, you can um, unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can put one in the chat, and Kirby and I will be keeping an eye on that. Um, I'm not going to do speaker bios this morning. I know most of you are very familiar with our speakers, but we do have so many of them and we want to be sure to hear, to hear from everyone. So I will skip their bios, but we are going to be hearing from Dana Young, who's the president and CEO of Visit Florida. Thank you for joining us, Dana. Um, Jorge Pesquera, who's president and CEO of Discover the Palm Beaches will be here. And we'll have Dave Lawrence, from who's the president and CEO of the Cultural Council. So David, thank you for joining us. George Lindley, the executive director of the Palm Beach County County Sports Commission will speak, as will Michelle Hillary, who is the Deputy Film Commissioner, and Phyllis Mann, the Director of Finance at the um, Film Commission. So thank you, all of you, for joining us. I'm sorry, I got those titles wrong. Um, Michelle is the Director of Finance. Phyllis Mann is the Director of Development and Marketing. So my apologies, ladies. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I wanna give you a couple of calendar items before we go straight on to our speakers. The next two Tourism Task Force meetings, if you mark your calendar, will be on February 10th and February 17th. So please mark your calendar for those. And then I have a couple of other additional calendar items that I'll be telling you about at the conclusion of the meeting. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and um, start the meeting. Kirby's going to be handling all of the technical aspects of the meeting, and it usually goes perfectly. And if it doesn't, then we'll just roll with the punches. But um, Kirby, I'm going to let you go ahead and get started. Dana, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Again, Dana is the president and CEO of Visit Florida. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it, and we're anxious to hear your comments. Well, thank you so much, Kelly, and thank you and Kirby for inviting me to be a part of your Tourism Task Force meeting this morning. Um, several of my Visit Florida team members are on here, and I uh, thanks to Leslie Pearsall, who's on from Visit Florida, who is going to handle all of the slides because I don't know how I could do that on my iPad. Um, as I mentioned to some of you, I'm actually in Miami right now, and I'm going to be heading up to Palm Beach County in about an hour as soon as I finish this uh, call. So looking forward to spending some time in your beautiful area of the state of Florida. And uh, I just hope you're all doing well and uh, really hope that this uh, uh, pandemic crisis that we're facing uh, ends soon and we can all get back to uh, welcoming millions of tourists to our area. Uh, and on that uh, note, I'm going to update you today on where we are uh, here in Florida uh, as far as updating our recovery plan for our tourism uh, industry. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of the initiatives that we've got going at Visit Florida, and then I'll be happy to take uh, any questions that you may have. And I will be mindful of your time. I'm gonna go through this kind of fast, but then if you have any questions at the end, of course, I'll be glad to go back and, and provide details. So you all are well aware of the importance of tourism in our state. Uh, it is, Florida is obviously one of uh, uh, the most important vacation places in the world and Palm Beach County is one of Florida's most iconic destinations. Uh, tourism is the backbone of our state economy. Uh, we had just capped off uh, 10 years of record visitation and the visitors that came to our state, uh, 130 million plus, uh, contributed $91 billion in spending to our state economy and supported 1.5 million jobs in the tourism and hospitality industries. So now here we are a little over a year later, uh, we are telling a very, very different story. Um, we estimate that roughly 66.4 million visitors came to Florida between January and September, but frankly, most of those were <laughs> January to March. Um, we had significant uh, uh, visitation in that Q1, but if you take that out, uh, 
we really have seen, uh, not surprisingly, a significant decrease. Um, it's important to note that nearly all of the visitors that have come to Florida are domestic visitors, uh, given the border closures and international uh, shutdowns and restrictions that continue to ground our international travelers. Uh, very sadly, visitation from Canada is at an all-time low. Um, it's down nearly 57% this year, but we, we actually believe that those numbers are much, much, much higher. Uh, it's just a, a sort of a, an issue with the statistical modeling that we use. Um, so Canada is, is uh, our number one overseas market, and we're just not seeing Canadians here because they are unable to keep their health insurance. Uh, if they travel. So uh, moving through uh, what we've been doing, um, the numbers are not positive. Let me go back to Q Q2 to Q3. We did see an increase. Uh, we saw about 9 million visitors come during that, during that time period, which, you know, when you look at it, it's a 71% increase. Uh, not particularly, uh, I wouldn't jump and scream and uh, be overly excited about that, but it is an increase and it did directly coincide with the launch of our marketing campaigns. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing uh, in terms of how we are getting visitors back into our communities to spend money to start reviving our economy. And I will tell you that of the $2.7 billion uh, state budget hole that has been created by this, uh, tourism, the tourism industry accounts for about half of that because we generate more sales tax revenue than any other industry in the state. So to put that in with a more positive spin, uh, if we can start beating the projections and bringing people back more quickly than the economists think is possible, then our economy will recover more quickly. And so that is our goal with Visit Florida is to get people coming back to the state, uh, unapologetic marketing and uh, beating those trends. So let me talk a little bit more specifically about our marketing efforts. Um, as the pandemic was first unfolding, uh, we began developing immediately back in March a data-driven phase recovery plan for tourism. Uh, we, we looked at all types of metrics because we wanted to make sure that our messaging was going to be falling on receptive ears. So we were looking at things like uh, a visitor perception of uh, the destinations, uh, destination readiness. You know, how do people feel? How do the people in Palm Beach County feel about having Palm Beach marketed at, at various times during this situation? And so we were very mindful of that. Uh, we've been tracking it for literally for months and we felt back in August that it was an appropriate time to begin marketing at the state level. Uh, it's not uh, brain, it's not rocket science to know that people uh, were more comfortable traveling closer to home. And so we launched a very robust in-state marketing plan. Uh, the idea was to kind of get people uh, to remember how fortunate we are to live in a state where the rest of the world wants to vacation. You know, how fortunate were all of us in April when things were generally closed to be able to still walk out on the, you know, next to the beach or in the beautiful sunshine or on our back patios and, you know, sit with our families, uh, even if we were distanced, you know, to be able to be in such a beautiful environment uh, in a warm, wonderful climate is truly a blessing. So that was the heart of this campaign was helping people remember how lucky they are, uh, instilling that pride of being Floridians and telling people to get out within Florida, uh, find new things, have new experiences and support our local businesses that were so desperate uh, for business at that time. Um, it was very successful, but I'll talk about that in a minute. I think I have the video uh, and I'd love to show it to you. We wake up to it every day, the wonderment the warmth. Where else can you just step outside for an epic sunset? Snap a postcard from your own backyard. Discover treasures on any old Tuesday. Enjoy a weekend where the world vacations. We live here because we love here. A place unlike anywhere else in the world is the place we call home. My hope and my guess is that many of you saw that uh, when it was airing. Um, it was 
a very, very successful campaign. And I'm not, I'm looking in my notes and they don't reference it, but I will tell you that that campaign, uh, the return on ad spend on that was around um, 153 to one. And it generated over 750,000 hotel room nights within the state of Florida. Uh, that was $40 million in gross revenue just from that in-state campaign. So we're very proud of that because we feel like as Visit Florida, we are impacting the projections in a more positive way. So moving right ahead, as we continued watching consumer sentiment and, and destination sentiment, uh, back in October, we realized that it was time. Uh, it was time for us to get in market. And so we, uh, outside the state of Florida, and so we created the domestic campaign. Uh, it is currently still in market in uh, drive markets within 700 miles of the state of Florida. Uh, people are willing to drive a little further for a Florida vacation than other places. 700 miles is a long way. But uh, you can see on your screen, uh, we're in Atlanta, Charlotte, Houston, Birmingham, Nashville, Philadelphia, and several other uh, large cities within that 700 mile uh, radius of the state. Um, these two campaigns combined, uh, this, this will be in market at least through the end of January. Uh, these two combined have earned a total of nearly 600 million impressions. Uh, the first one uh, we showed you was in the uh, 300 million impression range, and then this is, you know, takes up the rest. But uh, interestingly, uh, our data shows that people who have seen our advertisements are 70% more likely to come to Florida. And they also, even though it wasn't the main um, gist of the ads, they believe more people that have seen the ads believe that Florida is a very safe place to vacation, uncrowded with wide open spaces. And it was a pretty significant um, difference, like 30 more percentage points of people felt that Florida was open and safe and all of that uncrowded than people that had not seen our advertisement our advertising. So obviously uh, we are just continuing to show people that there is an endless uh, stream of wonderful, safe, uh, memorable vacation experiences awaiting them in Florida. And uh, again, the goal unapologetically is to get them to come to our state and uh, spend lots of money here. So the video I'm about to show you is uh, one of our ads from this domestic campaign that again is still in, uh, in market now. There you are. But what if instead you were here? That one letter difference changes everything. Here shifts your perspective. Because vacations are less about what you do and more about what they do to you. So give yourself over to the sounds of waves washing up on shore. To naps on the beach, to full days without shoes or shirts or worries. Say yes to something new. Try talk, try the front row, try this. Something happens that's indescribable. You are more you. They are more them. You see each other in a brighter light. And the warmth of those moments never fades. Somehow a vacation can take you to exactly where you need to be. Which is, of course, here. That's the power of a Florida vacation. So I hope you like that ad. Um, I think it's great. We've gotten a lot of uh, accolades nationally for this Power of Vacation uh, ad and it's working very, very, very well. So uh, more on that. Um, I, I'm gonna just touch very briefly on international uh, marketing. We are, um, we have, we have retained all of our in-country representation except in China. We have permanently pulled out of China uh, and that was done back in January. But uh, all of our other international agencies have been very much a part of what we've been doing since March. So the UK, 
uh, Germany, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to leave somebody out, Canada, obviously, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and you know, Argentina to the extent that, you know, we, we realize they're in some financial difficulties now, but hopefully uh, that will change and they will, they will be able to return uh, in large numbers. So we have been, we have kept all our agencies and we haven't just been checking in with them. We've been actively working with them to not only maintain the relationships that we had with travel agents and tour operators and so forth within their countries, but to build new relationships and to uh, take the opportunity for downtime on their part to build understanding of specific destinations within the state of Florida. So for example, in the UK, we uh, sponsored a Florida Fest with TTG, which is one of their biggest travel publications. And it was a four day event. Uh, we had over 450 people register uh, and it was very, very successful. Um, we have we did some fun things like a paddleboard yoga thing where everybody at home had their yoga mats and was, they were able to participate. Uh, we did a beer tasting with a Florida craft brewery who has distribution in the UK. So amazingly, they were able to ship beer to all of the people that registered for the beer tasting in advance, and then they were able to do it online, which was fun. And, you know, it's all of these little things that put Florida sort of one step ahead of the rest, keep us top of mind, so that when these borders do open, uh, we are able to get back in person immediately and just kind of pick up where we left off rather than trying to reestablish ourselves. Um, we have had over 40 uh, very innovative virtual events in uh, UK uh, and in several markets in Latin America. We're also uh, involved in a campaign currently with the Weather Network and Air Canada uh, to promote Florida to Canadian travelers for the winter and spring travel season in hopes that uh, with the expanded um, access to the vaccine, they will be able to come to Florida even for a, a shortened winter season. And, and this is really important because we, we, to our knowledge, we are the only uh, destina statewide destination marketing organization in the United States that's doing anything internationally. Um, and uh, we are, in my knowledge, probably the only state right now that's marketing outside their borders. Uh, you probably saw that South, Car uh, South Dakota had several uh, ads that were running in the late summer, but now they are under several feet of snow and uh, no one is going to South Dakota right now. So we are out there. Uh, we have a, a, a significant strategic and competitive advantage by being really the only voice uh, for travel uh, for states. I mean, I'm sure you've seen some of the sandals commercials in Atlanta and some of that, but in terms of state tourism marketing, we're pretty much it. So uh, we are just thrilled to welcome people back to our state and uh, looking ahead, uh, Florida Huddle is our uh, annual event for international tour opera operators and wholesalers. Uh, unfortunately, this has to be in a virtual uh, format this year, but it will be February 8th through 12th. And this more than anything does lend itself to uh, the virtual format because you've got a lot of uh, folks, a lot more folks that can probably participate because of the cost. So we're able to get a larger group of travel agents and tour operators uh, interacting with our destinations than we would have uh, just in a normal year. Uh, we'll also be launching our, our typical domestic winter campaign uh, very soon. And this year we are reaching beyond our typical uh, geographic areas for this. Uh, there, are, there are some areas of this country that are really crummy, crummy places to live right now. Uh, Seattle, Washington is one, Portland, Oregon is another, and I would say anywhere in the state of California. So we are going to be marketing in uh, the Pacific Northwest and California uh, because their typical winter vacation destinations of Hawaii and Mexico are not readily available, but we have many, many new direct flights. So uh, that is going to be an expansion of our winter campaign. We've partnered with American Allegiant and Air Canada Airlines uh, and significant other brands to continue uh, developing our international marketing experiences. Look, we are in a position right now where we do not just want to regain our market share uh, domestically and internationally, we want to exceed it. We want to use the strategic advantage that we have uh, and build our market share during this time of, uh, of uh, a transition. 
So with that, uh, I will wrap up. Hopefully I stayed within my time limit and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And I just thank you so much for letting me speak to you this morning. Well, Dana, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was very interesting and I, I learned some things, which is always good, right? Um, at this time, we'd like to open to any questions. If you have a question for Dana, please just unmute your microphone, introduce yourself and give us your question. Any questions from the audience this morning? I have a question that was sent to me in the chat. Um, it is, do you think at some point you will be back in China with its power to buy tourism or was it the distance and newness of our market as a destination? Well, the issue with China was that we do not have any direct flights uh, to the state of Florida from China or the pre-pandemic, no direct flights at all. That probably turned out to be a blessing that we didn't have any direct flights. Uh, but we also are in a situation where China is, you either have to be all in with a significant investment, uh, and this is again pre-pandemic, or uh, we were actually, we were very involved in a brand USA uh, uh, event and they were like, you're either all in or just don't waste your time and money. So we made the strategic decision that uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, it just doesn't make sense for us to be spending our uh, limited resources in a country that cannot easily bring people here, was not in our top 10, and frankly, doesn't like us very much. So we're focusing on countries that, uh, that do like us and that uh, are very robust in terms of bringing people here. Some of you may disagree with that. I appreciate your difference of opinion, uh, and uh, we can chat offline if you like. All right. I have, I have a question, Kelly. Uh, yes. Kirby, Kirby. <clears throat> Al Zucaro from World Trade Center Palm Beach. Next week, I'm hosting a delegation from the uh, my, uh, the Mexican consulate in Miami here in Palm Beach County to talk about uh, various items. One specific item that they wanted to talk about was tourism. Um, you mentioned earlier in your comments that you are addressing some of your tourism efforts to South America or looking south. Um, you didn't mention Mexico specifically. Is there any efforts uh, that that, uh, that I could understand or report on when the delegation comes next week. Absolutely, and if I didn't mention Mexico, that was my bad because our efforts uh, throughout the pandemic have been focused on Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. And in fact, um, I think it's within the last four to five weeks, we hosted a FAM from Mexico, an in-person FAM. And uh, they were in South Florida. I don't recall the specific destinations, but I can get that to you if that's helpful. Uh, would be. But we did Thank host you. journalists from Mexico here in Florida. We are 100% committed to the Mexican market. We see tremendous growth opportunity there. And uh, we're going to be continuing to put uh, significant resources into Mexico. I appreciate, I appreciate your responding to that. And whatever information you could send me, uh, I, would, uh, I would certainly uh, accept and be, be happy to get. Perfect, um, Lindsay Norris is on the call. Lindsay, if you wouldn't, I'm gonna be driving. If you wouldn't mind having Megan Doherty send that information to Al, uh, that would be great. Thank Excellent. you. Thank and you I, so much. I see Rose has her hand raised. Yes, hi, good morning. Thank you very much for everything, all of you. Dana, how can I help promote Palm Beach County to the Middle East. I represent Bahrain, but I'm a resident of Palm Beach County and absolutely love Florida. And I will do anything to help both sides. But specifically, we have travel agencies in Bahrain that might benefit from more, gaining more information about the Florida huddle. And they can share that info with the other Gulf countries in the region. Well, that would be wonderful. Um, we would love, we, we welcome all comers to Florida Huddle. And to the extent that you have uh, travel agents and tour operators in the Middle East and Bahrain that, that would be interested in that, we would love to have them. Uh, I think registration is still open. And again, my girl, Lindsay Norris uh, <laughs> can provide you with that information after the call and we can get that to you. Uh, and we would, we would welcome their participation. Thank you. Okay. May I follow up on one comment on that? Rose Sager and I did an event just uh, in December with regards to Bahrain and its relationship to Palm Beach County and this particular region. 
Uh, we have uh, already committed to putting together a delegation to, to travel to Bahrain as soon as travel restrictions are lifted. And that's a major effort on our part. Uh, uh, I actually have about a dozen people that have expressed interest in going already. So Bahrain in the Middle East is a real uh, new opportunity for us here in Palm Beach County. Well, that's fantastic. And, you know, you all are partners with us uh, through Jorge and his great team. And, you know, we would love to uh, hear about that uh, trade mission and uh, wish you all the best on that. And please give us any feedback uh, that you receive on how we can be more helpful. Thank you. Excellent, Dana. Excellent. Thank you very much for all of your all of your great questions. And Dana, thank you so much for your presentation. And I feel that this is the perfect segue for us to go to Jorge. Um, Jorge Pescura is the president and CEO of Discover the Palm Beaches. And um, thank you, Dana. You just queued up that transition perfectly. <laughs> so we'll go to Jorge now and and hear a little bit from him. If you guys have additional questions for Dana that we that you think of later. Um, you're welcome to reach out to her and Lindsay, or you can reach to Kirby and I, and we'd be more than happy to make sure that we get you whatever additional information you need. So thank you again, Dana, very much. And Jorge, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, first, I want to say congratulations to, to Dana uh, on her unapologetic uh, marketing efforts internationally. Uh, it's bold thinking, uh, and uh, it's wonderful to hear that. And um, you know, not just to regain our market share, but to exceed it. That's that's the kind of thinking we need to really get back on track. I'm glad that she's traveling up market from Miami to uh, Delray Beach today. So that's wonderful. And uh, also uh, happy to report that we're currently running a co-op campaign with Visit Florida. We hope uh, we'll bring a lot of visitors to Palm Beach County. So with that, uh, Mackenzie, I think, is running my slides. So uh, I'm going to skip the next couple of slides. So just move on to the next one right there. So just reporting on, on the state of uh, tourism in Palm Beach County. This is a weekly uh, report of uh, occupancy. And you can see that we've been stuck in the 40 to 45 percent range for quite a long time. Uh, contrary to what we had hoped, which would be to be in the 60s and 70s by the end of the year, we did have a, a bump in December during the um, New Year's and Christmas weeks, but uh, we're back to 50% as of the January, uh, first week of January. So uh, we're still challenged. And uh, next slide shows that uh, we've also been improving from a holiday occupancy point of view. You can see from Memorial Day at a 41% and then a low of, ju of 37 <laughs> in, on July 4th, uh, we hit 66, uh, almost 70, 67% on New Year's. So that's a, that's a positive trend. And uh, next slide shows uh, our ADR performance, that's uh, average daily rate. And uh, interestingly, you will see that just before August, we actually ran a higher rate than normally during the summer. We, uh, a lot of hotels were shut down and some of the resorts were able to command uh, tremendous rates during the summertime. So we actually had a better rate unusually uh, over the summer months than we did now, but now we're lagging behind about 15%. And that takes us to the next slide, which is REFPAR. And the same, the same story here. And you can see that we are, um, you know, keeping the same pattern as in ADR and with significant decreases in revenue per available room. For those who don't know the lingo, that's revenue per available room uh, of 48% down in November and 45% down in December. So hopefully January and February will bring better numbers. Next slide shows uh, revenue, uh, hotel room revenue. And again, that, that parallels the, the challenges that we have in, in filling the rooms and of course, room revenue is what brings us the bed tax. It is based on the room revenue that we collect the bed tax. And that was 43% down in the month of December. So we still have a long way to go. So with that, uh, I think I have one more slide before I show you something very interesting. That is the next slide. This is a, a slide that we borrowed from uh, HVS, Hotel Valuation Systems that Gustav gave me. And it shows that if we do all the right things, um, we could actually have everybody vaccinated by mid-June. And that would be 
a really, really good thing because it's only going to be if we get control of the pandemic that the industry that depends on people gathering for meetings, family reunions, and having a good time together uh, will be able to really recover uh, fully. So we're hopeful about that. So the next slide is the intro to our CARES Act campaign. And um, basically, uh, we were very fortunate that right around Thanksgiving time, we were able to put forth a, a proposal to, to the county uh, that su was successful at the end of the day. And we were able to get significant funding to launch a campaign that had to be uh, uh, deployed uh, during the month of December. The federal regulations regarding CARES funding required that we buy and we execute all of the campaign uh, components within the month of December. And so I'm gonna show you the next slide is the components of this campaign, uh, which uh, was about a $1.8 million uh, deployment. And mostly it was in digital and connected TV. Uh, you see some of the uh, channels that we used during uh, the campaign. Again, from November 27th to December 31, a lot of work, a lot of uh, uh, coordination with the different media buyers by our team. Uh, it, it included all these elements, out of home, paid social, TV, and so forth. And the target markets you see there are the typical Northeast markets, New York, Boston, Washington, Philly, but as well as some of the South Florida and Central Florida markets with almost $200 million, in 200 million impressions. So that's a big push. Hopefully give us a couple of uh, additional points. Next slide. This is the uh, breakdown of the budget. As you can see, $1.8 million, a lot to uh, TV in things like Roku and Hulu and other uh, all those uh, connected channels, uh, digital display, paid social, you see all of them there. And of course, we, we did a big buy with Expedia and Kayak, which are where a lot of people buy their, their travel these days. And you'll see how this shows. This is some of the digital display creative. We had to be very sensitive to the situation at hand, and we had to uh, deliver messages that, that, that focused on health and safety as part of our thinking process here. So these were uh, panels that would appear in a digital ad, one after the other, open spaces, covered faces, plan your trip. So it's kind of, think about the future, think about the seasons, think about when it's cold up in the north, you, you can plan on coming down here, or warm weather awaits when you're, when you're ready, book your winter space, escape. The next slide, shows uh, some of the creative on the paid social. This is on, of course, uh, Facebook and other channels. And, and it again, shows people in, uh, in uh, covered uh, with masks on and doing uh, distancing and so forth. Uh, so next slide. This is where when people clicked on those digital ads, they would land. And this was very important. This is something that the county actually required and we were happy to do it. And it spoke to our stringent uh, and rigid, uh, 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 compelling uh, uh, commitment to health and safety. We have been the destination with the greatest uh, implementation of the GBAC uh, accreditation program across the airport, the convention center, many hotels and cultural institutions. And so this was where people landed and they were able to see that we had a lot of things happening in terms of health and safety. Next slide. And this is some of the ads that you would see on Expedia and Kayak. And again, you could see here, book your winter scape uh, when you're ready uh, and so forth. Next slide. And these I really love because uh, these are uh, billboards out of home uh, display ads. And we were able to deploy these just when a major winter snowstorm hit the Northeast. You can see there the New Jersey billboard on a highway with uh, probably uh, 12 or 15 inches of snow on the, on, the, on the sides. And you can see in Philadelphia, this was on top of one of the iconic buildings in downtown. Uh, it was just a major, major uh, coup to be able to have these on time for that, uh, for that uh, uh, time of the year. And then the next one shows other, next, uh, next slide, shows some of the other cities, Baltimore, Washington, and Boston, just the same message of warm weather awaits in the Palm Beaches. 
and go to the palmbeaches.com. And please notice that we have the Palm Beaches Pledge uh, logo there as well, signaling our commitment to health and safety when people go come here. And finally, I'm just gonna show a quick ad that we did that was the deployed during that uh, time frame. Discover the Palm Beaches. Open spaces and sunny places are waiting for you to enjoy. Explore endless family attractions. Experience world-class museums and championship golf courses. Relax on miles of uncrowded beaches from Jupiter to Boca Raton. Plan your next vacation to America's first resort destination. Discover the Palm Beaches. Start planning your next trip at thepalmbeaches.com. That's it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Glad to be here with you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jorge. I have to say, all of these fabulous commercials just make me want to like take the rest of the day off. What do you guys think? <laughs> they really are beautiful. Um, thank you, Jorge, for your presentation. Now, let's open the floor to some questions. Does anybody have any questions for Jorge? Um, I do see there's one in the chat box. It says, um, are you optimistic about funding this year? Our state needs consistent support of tourism as we rebuild. Kelly, uh, I think, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the good news about funding, uh, if there are any, is that we uh, had anticipated a deeper um, decrease, a greater decrease in um, in revenues during 2020 than actually occurred. Uh, the, the high rates during the summertime for the resorts were very helpful. The, the um, shared economy accommodations, uh, Airbnb and uh, VRBO and the vacation rentals have had a pretty good run over this time frame, And so those reserves I think will be available to some extent during 2021 because we're going to be challenged during the uh, season for sure, because the pandemic is not over yet, because we're hitting some amazing, uh, terrible numbers during this time. The season is going to be challenged. So we're going to need those funds and we're going to be as creative as we can in deploying whatever funds are available to us. Excellent. Jorge, there is, an, there is another question. Do you, um, are you doing anything bilingual or multilingual? We have had a robust international presence uh, up until the pandemic hit. We had to put all of these on pause, just like most other destinations. I'm glad that Visit Florida <clears throat> has re restarted those international markets, and we will uh, be opening that up as soon as we can. Uh, it's, it's a matter of funding availability and what the priorities are going to be in order to bring as many visitors as possible to fill the hotels and the restaurants and our attractions and cultural institutions as quickly as possible. So first things first, uh, we have a, a very talented international market uh, director and, and uh, an assistant to him that are gonna continue those efforts and continue to be in virtual events. We'll be at Florida Huddle in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, so we're gonna continue those efforts. Excellent. And I have one last question for you, Jorge. Sure. Um, as season has, um, as the season has started to a slow start this year, we have seen a decline in the ADR. Do you think this trend might change in the next couple of months? Well, we hope that the $1.8 million we just deployed during the month of December <laughs> is going to help. Um, again, uh, we are, uh, and this has been said so many times in uncharted territory again, uh, the, the unfortunate situation is that we're going to have the peak of our season coincide with the peak of the pandemic. And so uh, I, I, it all, it's all dependent on how the vaccine rollout takes effect. We know there's been some challenges with that during the first few weeks. We hope that that will be resolved and we can get millions of people vaccinated on a daily basis coming, uh, moving forward. And, and that's what uh, hopefully the, the late season and, and springtime will be the earliest we see a real resurgence in uh, uh, tourism activity nationwide. 
Excellent. Thank you for that update, Jorge. Um, I so appreciate all your expertise, expertise and your entire team, um, all the talent they bring to the table for us. Thank you very much. And of course, if you have additional questions for Jorge, you're welcome to reach out to him or you can reach to Kirby and I and we'll be sure and get you whatever information you need. Thank you very much, Jorge. Now we're going to move to um, David Lawrence. David Lawrence is the president and CEO of the Cultural Council. Those of you who are not familiar with this organization, I'm sure most of you are, but if you're not, um, please join immediately. I've been a member forever. <laughs> David, I'm going to let you take it away and, and tell us what's going on in your beautiful building in Lake Worth. I love that building. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Lawrence, President and CEO of the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County. Um, I want to start with good news. And that is uh, in a regular year, the arts and cultural sector in Palm Beach County generates more than $633 million in economic activity. That's every single year right here in Palm Beach County. That is split pretty evenly among direct spending. So that's what cultural organizations use to paint sets, build costumes, pay their actors and musicians and all of that. But it's also an indirect spending. So this is um, you as, as a patron or visitors to our cultural institutions um, buying dinner beforehand, paying the babysitter, paying for parking, um, buying a cocktail at intermission, all of those things um, uh, uh, are attributed to the $633 million every single year in economic activity. That translates into more than 3.9 million attendees every single year here in Palm Beach County. And the arts and cultural sector employs 14,000 full-time equivalent jobs. So the sector is an important part of our economy and indeed important part of um, our tourism sector. So let's talk a little bit about COVID. Um, since the start of the pandemic in March, these figures here are just from March until August and only about half of the organizations were responding to this. They have already incurred more than $48.3 million in economic loss just in that very brief time period. They lost nearly a million in attendance. There were more than 1,600 canceled events and 593 full-time or part-time furloughs. So the pandemic has had an enormous impact on arts and culture. But what I'm thrilled to tell you is that we are a resilient uh, sector. And the, um, the, the sector is already bouncing back um, uh, in, in many, many ways. One of the ways that the Cultural Council has been working to help the cultural sector is through a social media campaign we're calling Restart with the Arts. Um, getting folks to donate, to visit, to join organizations, to do it safely, um, and to find those opportunities uh, to, to get re-engaged. We're all feeling a little bit of cabin fever at this point. So uh, the cultural uh, organizations are open and ready to receive um, visitors. Here's some more specific ways that the Cultural Council assisted the sector in recovery. Um, we created a COVID-19 resource page with information, resources, grant opportunities, other funding um, opportunities for artists and cultural organizations. Um, through our professional development series, we offer to cultural workers, our Institute for Cultural Advancement, we held special COVID-19 webinars talking to artists about how to sell your work online. What are the best online technical systems for organizations to use to present virtual programming? All of these things to enable cultural organizations to reach their audiences virtually during this, during this time period. We created and fundraised for the Palm Beach County Artist Relief Fund, where we provided small grants of $250 to over more than 100 artists who had had gigs canceled, um, performances and exhibitions canceled because of COVID so that they could pay bills, um, you know, buy new art supplies, all of those sort of things. And most recently we launched the Palm Beach County Cultural Resiliency Fund through CARES Act money, um, awarding up to $25,000 to cultural organizations with relief dollars to help them as they begin the recovery process. Additionally, and in terms of cultural tourism, um, every May we've been hosting Mosaic, which is an acronym for month of shows, art, ideas, and culture. In 2020, we expanded that to months of shows. So we ran that all the way through the end of 2020 with hotel offers and two for one discounts and other ways to encourage people to come out and participate in the cultural organizations and to do so safely. 
Um, the background image that you'll see is a great collage that um, Palm Beach County artist Bruce Helander created for the Mosaic campaign. So Mosaic will come back in 2021 and my team is hard at work right now on, on making all those preparations um, during what is typically known as shoulder season. So again, we're working to make sure that we're bringing residents and visitors back to Palm Beach County and to our cultural institutions. There's a couple of things as we look forward, um, other ways that the cultural organizations are really thinking outside of the box and being innovative in their approach to returning. One of them is Palm Beach Opera. They are doing an opera festival in February, February 19th through the 27th, and they're doing it at the South Florida Fairgrounds in the outdoor amphitheater, and they're going to do three operas in um, repertory. So if you are worried about being in an enclosed space, here's an opportunity to come back to see an opera in an outdoor space and to get re-engaged with the cultural sector. So this is some really great innovative thinking that is, um, that is going to help the opera um, get back on track sooner rather than later. Um, later this fall, the Malt Jupiter Theater will complete step one of a major and amazing transformation of their theater space. They're, they've been closed this whole past year, um, and they're going to um, be able to welcome people back to a, to a larger venue that in, uh, eventually will be able to hold pre-Broadway tours of performances. So this will be a very important way that South Florida can be put on the map to help take shows um, to, uh, to New York um, and, and have them sort of grown right here in South Florida. So those are just two examples of cultural organizations that are thinking outside of the box and, and moving projects forward and finding new ways to engage with their audiences during this difficult time. Of course, our cultural tourism campaign continues and we work very closely with Discover and our other TD, TDC agency partners um, on making sure that people feel safe and welcome coming back um, and putting arts and culture to the forefront. One of the ways we're doing this, everybody loves the giant sunglasses. Those will make a return very soon. They're going to show up at Abacoa um, for uh, the um, Arti Gras um, that is coming back. In, uh, so those are coming out very soon. Um, so we're working as hard as we can to make sure that recovery and resiliency is a part of everything that we do so that we can make sure that visitors come back to Palm Beach County and understand that we truly are Florida's cultural capital. I thank you very much. It's great to be on this panel with such an esteemed group of, of speakers um, who are all working together to make sure that we are um, welcoming folks back to the Palm Beaches. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so very much, um, David, for your comments. Um, yes, and all the organizations are working hard together. We're, we're all unified under this goal of, of getting our hotel rooms full and getting our cultural venues full and all the things that we love so much about this area. Um, so thank you very much, Dave. You really did have some wonderful good news, and I appreciate that. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Dave? Hearing no questions, I think we'll move to the next speaker. Um, I will encourage you to go to the Cultural Council website and see all of the things they have going on. Um, such a fabulous organization. And if you're not a member, you really should join. <laughs> all right. Thanks again, Dave. And thank you to your team uh, for putting together that presentation for us. Um, we really do appreciate it. And now we're going to move to our um, last speakers. This is Michelle Hillary, who's the uh, deputy. Kelly, Kelly, Kelly. Kelly. Yes. Um, we have George. Oh, I'm so sorry. George, George, how could I forget you? I don't know. I'm going to get fired. Kirby's going to fire me. George, I apologize. I slipped out of order. Okay, George is going to be next. Um, George is the executive director of the Palm Beach County Sports Commission. And we all know just how important sports are to Palm Beach County. If you're not sure about that, just look at the two beautiful um, facilities we have here for spring training and, and all of the interest around the country in that. So George Kirby, thank you very much from saving, for saving me from an embarrassing mistake. George, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Tell us what's going on in your world. No, thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to be here and, uh, and I'm honored to be with such a great panel and to talk about our sports commission and how we are trying to persevere through the pandemic and, and to give you an idea of what the pre-COVID sports tourism landscape look like and, and how we're, we're trying to build it back. Uh, it is, I have the, the great privilege of working with Discover the Palm Beaches, the Film and TV Commission, 
the Cultural Council. They have been great sister agencies and great partners. Uh, we, I believe Glenn Jurgensen, the Executive Director of the Tourist Development Council is also on this call, who's provided great leadership to all of the, the TDC agencies. And, uh, and from a, a sports tourism perspective, and remember our mission at the Sports Commission is to develop tourism through sports. And we primarily achieve that mission through the recruitment of sporting events, hosting and supporting of events. In some cases we create events all in an effort to attract visitors from outside of the county and to stimulate bed tax revenues. And pre-pandemic, the landscape for sports tourism in this county was incredibly robust. Palm Beach County has made a dedicated effort to include sports as part of its tourism fabric. Its sports tourism is a major part of the overall growth that this county experienced pre-pandemic for tourism. And it's a, it's sports plays a major role in Florida's tourism economy uh, and, has, and has done so for quite a while. So pre-pandemic, we've seen, an, we saw our event portfolio that the Sports Commission manages grow by 100% over the last decade, uh, double, uh, which speaks to the volume of venue development infrastructure that we've seen in this county and to, to growth of the sports travel industry. So it, we, until 2020, the pandemic year, our event portfolio has grown each and every year and has grown significantly. More importantly, the number of hotel room nights created from sports related visitors has also grown. Since 2012, we saw eight straight years of improving room night performance and the numbers, our, our growth for hotel impact has risen very significantly, uh, which I'll touch on in a second. Our sports commission pre-pandemic was at, was at a, the, the highest in terms of its event portfolio, hosting 180 events per year, amateur and professional events, events that attracted visitors from across this great state, across the nation, and across the globe. And we were just at a 260,000 room night mark. Going into 2020, we had the best first and second quarter that, this, that we've seen in the history of the sports commission. We believed we were going to grow our room night number by 15 to 20%. We'd be on the cusp of 300,000 room nights for the first time. That's pre-pandemic. From 2015 to 2019, we saw sports-related hotel room nights grow by nearly 40%. Again, sports tourism was, is a big part of this county's growth that we've seen pre-pandemic, and sports-related visitors were, were growing at a, a significant rate. Then, unfortunately, when March of 2020 hit, we had to adjust. We had to, to modify our game plan. And COVID-19 transformed what is widely regarded as the most recession-resistant tourism product in the United States. Sports travel, especially from the youth, amateur youth market, actually grew slightly during the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009. But a health crisis, a health pandemic, transformed sports travel into one of the most vulnerable tourism products. The nature of gathering and a community coming together for sport just didn't work when you were dealing with the health crisis. And so the first, what we did as a TDC together was to create, working together with all the agencies to recreate, uh, to create a recovery plan, a recovery strategy. And our sports commission worked with the agencies, and we reached out to our industry, the National Association of Sports Commissions, national governing bodies for sport. We worked with the United States Olympic Committee, who was putting out recovery plans. And we, we absorbed as much information as we can so that we could be an ally to sport event rights holders trying to do business in this great state of Florida and in our county. And so a quick summary of the recovery stage is the, the, the first part, stage one, there was four steps was for us to identify sports and venues that lend themselves to social distancing, understanding what sports that we could bring back first that would have the most success in thriving during a pandemic stricken year. Sports like golf and tennis, which were first to come back from a leisure spec, uh, perspective, equestrian, outdoor sports versus indoor sports. We looked at the dynamics there, individual sports versus team sports. And then we, we began to try to absorb information on how we can modify events to, to come back during the pandemic. Then the next stage was to support the recovery of local sports leagues, camps, activities, and events. 
We're not going to be hosting a global competition until our local sport leagues can practice and play games. And we, we worked with our Parks and Rec team, and we became involved in that process. The third stage three, and this is primarily where we're at right now, is this, the start of implementing sporting events that would attract participants from Florida's drive market. So that is, that is primarily where we're at right now. We're working to get net, uh, to stage four, and it's a long road ahead of us, but that would be to reestablish and launch national sporting events that will ultimately attract participants from uh, across the country and eventually beyond, and that would, uh, would aid airlift. So that is where we're working to, to get to. Like I said, the first part of FY20 was the best first and second quarter that we've enjoyed at the Sports Commission. However, the last six months of FY20, we lost our entire event portfolio, mostly. 77 booked events were canceled or relocated, projecting about 85,000, close to 86,000 room nights that, that we lost, and nearly $60 million in economic impact reduction is what we project. That's a hard hit. That's a hard pill to swallow. However, as we moved into the first quarter of FY21, which is October 1 through the end of December, we're still, we're still dealing with the pandemic and it's still impacting us significantly, but there is some positive momentum. We are beginning to move into that stage three, hosting events that cater to the drive market and even launched a couple national events. And with the limited time I have, I'm just gonna give you a glimpse into how we're starting the first quarter and, and the, the positive side of what we've seen. So during the first quarter, we, our sports commission did host 29 sporting events that primarily attracted visitors from across Florida, but we did have a couple national events join the stage, one and an event with some international, um, international exposure. We project that uh, when we're done calculating the room nights, we'll be about just under 20, 28,000, 27,000 room nights. Uh, for quarter one. Now, compare that again to quarter one of 2020, we have a long way to go. In, 20, in 2020, quarter one, we hosted 55 events that generated nearly 65,000 room nights. So we're down about 50, no, almost 60% in terms of sports, our sports tourism production for this quarter one, almost 37,000 room nights that we lost in 26 events. But the good news is we hosted those 29 events. That's, we're that's the building block for sports tourism recovery. And we worked with, the, with every event rights holder on developing safety protocols and, a, a, and working with them on safety plans to make sure that these events would come back in a responsible manner. Safety, and safety is at top, the top priority when we're trying to bring sporting events back to life. Couple highlights. We did host the PGA Tour, actually the PGA Tour Champions, which was formerly the PGA Senior Tour. Uh, this event has existed in our county since 2007 under various title sponsors. We did uh, ProLink Sports, the local management company, landed a new sponsor for this year, which is a, a big victory in its own right. The event was eliminated all spectators. It was not open to the public. However, it was televised live on the Golf Channel for three days, uh, 54 holes, all, again, televised live, a great spotlight for our county. Believe it or not, ice hockey was part of our return. We hosted two ice hockey events at our county's ice facilities. Uh, Blue Line Hockey, which is an established promoter, primarily teams from Florida and the Southeast, but we did have some teams from the Northeast come in, over 120 teams. The event was handled very carefully. It was The games were staggered. Uh, they were very mindful of how many teams were in the venue at once, and it was, it was a great success for us. We hosted our, our first national event at our spring training facilities. We worked day in and day out on with the TDC and our county to, to bring this event back to the Palm Beaches in a very careful manner. It was the first national tournament, first baseball showcase to take place at our spring training facility since the pandemic. It took place over two weeks. This is Men's Senior Baseball League. So we had competitors from 20 years of age to over 70, 800 athletes, nine different states were represented, over 3,000 room nights. Now, last year, this event had over 120 teams and over 6,500 room nights, but still, it's a victory for us. We modified the event so we could bring it back to life. And we had two national golf tournaments take place at PGA National. The American Junior Golf Association 
uh, hosted two events during a nine day stretch in November, about 1500 room nights, 350 junior golfers. And of course, we've been working all along this pandemic with equestrian sport productions. They have, they actually helped define roles of return for the national governing body for the United States Equestrian Federation. And during the month of December, we supported their effort in hosting their holiday and horses circuit, which is a precursor to the winter equestrian festival, which is happening right now. There was international competition at this event. And finally, uh, just a, another event I wanted to spotlight, our sports commission worked closely with ESP and events to make sure the Boca Raton Ball would take place for the seventh straight year at FAU Stadium. A lot of modifications happened at this game. There was no activation outside of the stadium or a lot of the, the pregame celebration was removed. 6,000 attendees allowed in a 30,000 seat stadium, but it was another made for TV event that generated over 1.5 million viewers. Uh, and will contribute again. There, what the ho there is hotel impact even with these made-for-TV events. So slight hotel impact that moves the needle a little bit. Finally, when we looked at quarter one, originally on the books, it was it was going to be a, a, a robust 2021, just like 2020 uh, was for us in quarter one. But we did lose 33 booked events, including the world's largest field hockey. Uh, sorry, the world's largest lacrosse tournament that was scheduled to take place, which we was ultimately relocated. 42,000 room nights we project were eliminated and that would result into about $30 million of economic impact that we lost. But the, the effort to host 29 events is a victory. It's the start of re a recovery that we hope will continue to grow as we get into the spring and to the summer. And uh, we have to start somewhere. And so looking at the positive side, yes, we lost a lot of business, but we are hosting events in a responsible, careful manner. And I hope that uh, that that effort will continue to grow. And before you know it, we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll be back to some type of normalcy. And with that, I will conclude uh, my update. Excellent. Thank you so much, George. Great information. It is for those of you, and I know most of you are, but if you're not familiar of the impact uh, that sports has in our economy, this is a good, a good eye opener for you because it is significant. We're actually going to skip the questions. We do have a couple of questions and George um, Kirby will make sure that you get those and who asks so you can reach back to them with their answers. But I do wanna move along to our next speakers. We are gonna run a little bit late. Um, and so I'm going to apologize in advance, but I want us to have a chance to hear from the folks um, at the Film Commission. So with that, I'm going to introduce um, Michelle Hillary. She is the Deputy Film Commissioner and Director of Finance and Phyllis Mann, who's the Director of Development and Marketing. So ladies, I'm going to turn the stage over to you. We're all very interested to hear what you have to contribute. What a great panel of presenters. Thank you to all of you. And Michelle, we're so excited to hear what you have to say. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I agree. This has been a great panel of speakers. We're very honored to be a part of this. And uh, of course, to share how, how what our position is as far as marketing the county as a destination for business. Um, certainly as a film and television commission, we market the county as a destination to bring in feature films, commercial still photography shoots. And we facilitate and provide permits for commercial production to take place here on public property here in Palm Beach County. Uh, we're one of 50 film commissions throughout the state of Florida, but only, but only the only film commission uh, who has expanded our portfolio of simply being a film commission that facilitates permits and secures locations into now uh, actually creating and launching Palm Beach County's official tourism TV channel, being the Palm Beaches TV. And uh, Phyllis is going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, Phyllis, if you could, Phyllis is running the slideshow. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I wanted to touch upon like all of the other agencies, uh, COVID certainly has had an impact on the film and television industry. We've had our challenges on so many different levels, uh, but we have remained open throughout this entire uh, year of, of dealing with COVID we have remained open, but as I said, not without its challenges. 
you know, certainly we, as we are facilitating locations and dealing with our parks that were originally closed, buildings that were closed, shutdowns, um, into, you know, just the logistics of our industry as a whole, from large crews gathering uh, to uh, touching all of the equipment uh, that has to be used on location, to travel restrictions, um, actors interacting with one another, you know, these were all things that we had to work through. Like all of us, we had to kind of rethink not only marketing efforts, but how we were conducting business. Uh, very early on, Florida came out uh, with the very first uh, over 101 recommendations for clean and healthy sets that was used as a model for other states to, to implement as well. So we're very happy with that, uh, very proud of that uh, accomplishment. It actually set the stage for our industry getting back to work very quickly, where we thought that we were gonna be one of those industries that how, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna get back together? And that was really a great starting point for our state. We also, for every permit that we facilitate, uh, the production company has to have a set and safety plan in place um, as we're working with our municipalities and taxing districts to facilitate on location production. That is part of the process is that they explain how they're going to be safe and uh, make sure that their sets are, are safe and keeping our community safe as well. Uh, another thing that that started uh, from all of this is certification of COVID compliance officers. Uh, not all production companies require this, but some of our larger productions require compliance officers on set who has been trained to make sure that these safety measures, uh, new rules and regulations are being followed. So that's another step in the right direction. We've been very um, uh, much in close contact with our indigenous production companies. Uh, a little known fact, Palm Beach County is home to over 124 production related companies who call Palm Beach County home. So we're in touch with them on a regular basis uh, through our community outreach, kind of figuring out what kind of challenges they're facing, um, you know, layoffs or, or how travel has been restricting them. Uh, certainly um, we've seen a lot of production, more production here locally because of travel restrictions. So we've, they've been doing more business at home, which is wonderful. And something that all of the agencies, I believe, have mentioned is the collaboration uh, that we started early on in this process with all of our agencies. Um, this was so important that we were all singing to the same page of, of music, if you will, that whatever messaging that we were putting out through social media or on the Palm Beaches TV was uh, cohesive and we were all, um, uh, you know, again, on the same page of what stage we were in the recovery process. And one of the um, initiatives that we started right in the very beginning was a weekly Facebook watch party, which allowed us to uh, provide timely messages uh, that went out uh, to our potential uh, visitors and locals uh, Glenn Jurgensen, who is one of is the is the host of the show that we put out weekly, and Phyllis is going to touch on that a little bit more as well. And all of this circled back around, of course, to the Palm Beaches pledge and the importance to let uh, the audience know, our potential visitors, our production, our, our production clients know that health and safety was the number one priority for us. Next slide, please, Phyllis. So. Um, what I can tell you is that, uh, per, you know, content has always been king, but it's even more so now. Uh, so we have had a pretty robust portfolio of projects that have been filming, filming throughout this process over the course of this year when with dealing with a pandemic. This is a sampling of some of the higher profile uh, projects that have shot over this past year. Next slide, Phyllis. Um, production data wise, um, I wanted to focus on the total number of permits. I wanted to show sort of the last five years of the permits that we've issued in non-permitted projects. You can see in 2019, uh, from January to December, we facilitated 325 permits to shoot here in, in, uh, in Palm Beach County on public property. 
and 234 non-permitted productions. And what that simply means is that we work with these production entities to facilitate a production here that didn't necessarily need a permit. Possibly they shot at a private home or on private property or even at one of our production facilities. And of course, compared to uh, 2020, where we facilitated 260 permits and 209 non-permitted uh, non productions. So we are, obviously we saw some decreases, but what I will say is in the months of October and December, we saw some of the highest production numbers that, we, that we've seen since the pand pandemic started and even over those same months last year. Next slide. So production revenue, we are looking at a pretty significant decrease in production revenue. Um, you know, that is certain, and, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, because of the restrictions of travel, smaller crews now are putting together these production projects. Um, so they're on very tight budgets. More local production is taking place. So this is about 35% decrease. This is a projection. Um, since we don't have all of our December numbers in as of yet. Um, so uh, we are projecting that this is roughly what we're going to see. And it kind of goes hand in hand with what we're seeing with tourism as well in those numbers. Next slide, please. We know that film induced tourism works. Um, you know, we uh, in, in 2013, Visit Florida came out with a stat uh, that said 22% of domestic tourists surveyed said that something that they saw on a film or television show contributed to their decision to travel to our state. So we love that statistic. And um, you can see by just a sampling of some of these high impact television shows and the feature film Dolphin Tale, the impacts that something like this can have to a community, to a state with people who are being employed. This is a high wage, high skilled industry, and it has an economic impact when money is being dropped here, you know, locally or in, within the community or state. Um, and, uh, and what I can say is, and Phyllis, you can go to the next slide, please. You know, Florida is the only state in the Southeast that does not currently have an incentive program to incentivize film or television production. We we're working very closely in Tallahassee to change that. We believe that we can have an impact on the recovery, a very quick impact on the recovery through uh, the COVID crisis. And uh, because of that, a lot of film commissions have created their own incentivized programs to help generate more business for their community. And Palm Beach County did something that was that is pretty unique. Um, and we really focused on the tourism industry, specifically how we can help impact tourism to our community and also how we can engage our local production companies. And, um, and that's where, you know, trying to keep this, as much of this business at home as much as we can. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Phyllis to talk more about our Palm Beaches TV and how we're doing that. Thanks, Michelle. As Michelle mentioned, you know, tourism, film induced tourism is an important component and brings a lot of activity to the area. And uh, we launched the first, uh, Palm, first ever Palm Beach County tourism TV channel to do exactly to, that, to entice more travel and inspire more travel to the Palm Beaches. This is really a 24 seven family friendly channel. Um, all the content that you see is similar to a feel that when you walk onto a Disney property hotel and you turn on the channel, you're flooded with uh, inspiration as to what you can do, see, and experience in the Palm Beaches. Um, it's, the, it's overseen by the Tourist Development Council, and it's really a platform for all of our agencies to share their relevant messaging, um, certainly during times of COVID and other times of year, to share uh, what, what they're working on to uh, invite visitors to the Palm Beaches. We actually have a lot of content airing on the Palm Beaches TV, 36 hours of original family-friendly programming. And this is just a sampling of some of the shows that are on there right now. Um, I encourage everybody to go on and watch it, the palmbeaches.tv. Uh, you can see the linear channel online. You can watch it as a video on demand option. And of course, we've targeted the hotels locally to air their channel as part of their in-room entertainment system. 
And that's what, that's what this slide shows you. There are many ways to watch the Palm Beaches TV, including a free mobile app. You can download it on obviously Apple or Android. And we are airing in a number of hotel partners across the county. We thank them for, for, for giving their guests and seeing the value and showing the Palm Beaches TV. What we hope is that somebody who's staying in a hotel room will see the channel, perhaps see, see and learn something new that they didn't know that the Palm Beaches offers and extend a stay or plan a trip for future travel or share the word to their friends and family to actually come visit uh, the Palm Beaches. However, the shows that end up on the Palm Beaches TV first actually air out in the marketplace. This is part of the Film Commission's original television tours and branded content sponsorship program, we call it. Um, the, all the programming that ends up on the Palm Beaches TV is actually overseen by a committee and evaluated if they should receive sponsorship support from the Film Commission. These are just a small sampling of shows that have recently aired in the marketplace. These shows have to air outside of Palm Beach County to attract visitors to the area. And as you can see, these are not just one-offs that are taking place. We're creating network style series programming, partnering with, with networks like uh, South Florida PBS that air these shows every quarter, uh, airing on Destination America, 40 million households, 40 million households with, with six episodes that air. So we are reaching a large market, uh, all to entice travel to the Palm Beaches. And we've taken that large library of content and turned it into uh, part of our recovery plan to bring tourism back to the Palm Beaches. We launched June 9th, um, the Palm Beaches TV Facebook watch party. Our initial launch was to attract the local visitor, or the local market, to get them to go outside to experience our natural areas. Um, you know, we have some of the best assets as we started off at this meeting with, you know, of outdoor adventures. And so we continue to do this every week uh, to, to, there are about 10, 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minute episodes reu reusing and repurposing the content from the Palm Beaches TV, all to drive traffic and to entice travel uh, to the Palm Beaches. Our phase one plan, like I said, was to the local market. Our phase two plan, we're still staying in uh, the drive market. So we're still marketing to the Palm Beaches TV. And hopefully maybe some of you all have been served that ad on, on, on Facebook. Uh, so we're reaching great, great amount of people here. You know, with, with every show, we kind of tweak the niche market, depending on what that show is. If it's a bird show, we kind of tweak who we're kind of targeting in the, Palm, in, in the Facebook Watch Party campaign. At this point, we've done 30 episodes. We're in season three. We reached over 700,000 people with a total views of 419,000 people. And the Facebook watch party is successful because of our partners as well. Uh, this is just a sample again of some of our partners who have shared, liked, engaged in a watch party. All it takes is for you to come online uh, every Tuesday at noon uh, to like or share it. And it continues to spread our message in support of already this campaign that we're doing on our own. So we thank our partners. And if any of you are on here, uh, we'd love for you to join this effort. And with that, I thank you for the time and I send it back to Kirby and Kelly. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, gosh, Phyllis and Michelle, that's an awful lot of information you packed into a very short period of time. And I certainly thank you for all of that. Uh, I know many of you are really familiar with these organizations, but if you're not, this is just a great way for you to understand the impact that they have and how they all work so well together. I find that really inspiring on how you guys all work together and support one another and on this mission that we're all on. Um, now, we had planned on doing some self-introductions, but we have run late, and I think we will save those for our next meeting. But I do have a couple of calendar items that I'd like to point out to you. First of all, the next Next two tourism task meetings will be on February 10th and February 17th. We'll be hearing from Discover the Palm Beaches on the 10th and some more information about the important work that they're doing and some new branding things that they have to 
tell us about. Very exciting meeting. And then on Wednesday the 17th, we're going to have kind of a major events update. Currently, we have the Honda Classic Sunfest, the South Florida Fair coming to give us some updates on their events. And we'll also hear from Laura Beebe at the um, Palm Beach International Airport. So please join us for that and get some updates from those people. We do have a couple of other events that we want to tell you about. One is on January 20th to 21st. This is um, an event by the Hotel and Lodging Association. It's called um, Eat In for Education. The, it's a fantastic event. Um, there is more information on it, of course, in the um, restaurant and lodging website. Kirby will put in a little contact information for somebody there so you can reach out to them. Um, but it looks like a really wonderful event. And then also we have a Southeastern Florida Tourism Summit. This is brought to us by the South Florida the Business Council, which is a combination of um, the Miami Chamber, the Fort Lauderdale Chamber, and also our chamber. And um, Discover the Palm Beaches is also involved in that great organization. They have put together a panel of experts um, on the Southeast e region of our state. So we will hear some updates from them. Please join us on January 26th, Tuesday, January 26th. So four great calendar items for you guys to mark and join us at all of those. I want to thank Kirby for her expert tease in the um, technical part of this and all of the support staff that helped our speakers. And thank you especially to our speakers. We so appreciate your time. We know how very busy you are and we want you to get right back to it. <laughs> so thank you very much everyone for coming. Kirby, if there's nothing else, I think we'll end the meeting. All right, thank you very much everyone. Have a safe and healthy day. Thanks again so much to our speakers. Great Bye. meeting. Bye everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye.